Welcome. Thanks everyone for coming. This is our fourth uh, lecture on stargazing in our series. Uh, the next one will be a month from now on the topic of black holes. And that's the end of the series for the spring, but we're putting together the series that starts in July and goes through December. So this will be a monthly thing indefinitely. Uh, so you guys, yeah. <laughs> so feel free to, to come back, tell your friends, advertise for us and such. Um, I'm Cameron. I'm a postdoc here. And these are all staffed by volunteer graduate students, postdocs, and faculty from the department. So, so uh, hopefully we'll, we'll keep this up. Um, the observing, as you may have seen, I, I kind of jumped ahead when I sent out the email this morning saying, oh, it's going to be clear. It's hazy, uh, which means we won't be able to see the, the most faint objects in the sky. Not that we would be able to in Pasadena anyway. But um, we should still be able to see the moon and Jupiter and uh, potentially some other objects. So stick around. Uh, after the lecture, we'll have a lecture for about 30, maybe 35 minutes. And then you're invited to either go out to the, to the fields just to the south of us by exiting the main building, going around, and uh, going back. This way there will be a gate and some people to help direct you with some signs. Um, you're also welcome to stay in the auditorium. We'll have events going on out on the field, both observing as well as here for the 90 minutes following the talk. Uh, we'll put together a panel of some specialists on different topics to answer questions that you may have about basically anything astronomy, planetary science, uh, or science in general, if you wish. And we'll try and do our best to, to, to answer, your, answer your questions. But uh, in the past, people have kind of rushed out because they're like, I want to see Jupiter, I want to see the moon. And then there, you have to wait in a line for 20 minutes to, to get on the telescope. So that'll be going for 90 minutes, and we'll be going for 90 minutes. So don't feel in a rush to get out there, because you may just have to wait anyway. I also encourage you not to use your cell phone too much out there, because the bright blue light from your cell phone ruins your night vision. So it'll make it harder for you to actually see the objects that you're looking th uh, at through the telescope. And. And uh, oh, and if you didn't see up at the at the entranceway, there were there were free flyers that have the whole lecture series and, and next month's date and time, as well on, as the backside has a, a map of what the sky should look like around this time from this location for the whole month of of May. And we'll we'll update this next time. We'll have one for June and so on and so forth. So. So without further ado, our speaker tonight is Jackie Velodson. She is a graduate student here. She's finishing up her sixth year, and she's graduating. She will be a Dr. Velodson in a few months, if all goes well. She, uh, she did her undergrad at MIT and now does research here, which she'll be talking a little bit about on um, radio signatures around low mass stars, not our own sun, but other stars. And she'll be following up on that research at the National Radio Astronaut, uh, the National, NRAO, National Radio Astronomical Observatories in Charlottesville, uh, Virginia. So please welcome Jackie Velodson. Mm -hmm. So, well, thank you, Cameron. Can everyone hear me? It's on. OK, good. Thank you, Cameron, so much for organizing these series. You guys may or may not know, but Cameron started this series in February. And it's really been great to have this in our department and to have a chance to talk to people about astronomy, basically my favorite thing ever. So thank you, everyone, for coming, too. So I'll be talking about the air we breathe here on Earth and the air we can't breathe on Mars and Venus, and its history throughout the solar system, and what that means for planets outside of our solar system. So first, a little bit about me and why I'm interested in this. So I use radio telescopes both in New Mexico, the very large array, and at the Owens Valley Radio Observatory here in California. It's in Big Pine. Has anyone ever been to Big Pine? On your way to Mammoth? Yeah, there we go. So if you are driving through Big Pine, look off to your right. 
and you will see these things as a little white dot in the distance. So I work on these telescopes, including helping build one. I feel really cool that I did that. Um, in order to use them to study nearby stars. And what I'm looking for on nearby stars is coronal mass ejections. So on the sun, when you have a solar flare, that's a big explosion. And the biggest of these explosions cause a giant magnetized fireball to be thrown off of the sun. And that's called a coronal mass ejection. If that hits the Earth, that's what causes the northern lights the aurora. Now, in other nearby solar systems, the stars there have a lot more flares than the sun. So we wonder, what could this mean for planets? And one thing it could mean is that they could potentially blow away all the air for planets around these stars. So I use radio telescopes to look for these things around other stars in order to understand what they would do to planets. And that's what got me interested in understanding what's happened to the air on the planets in our own solar system. We need to understand that so that we can answer this big question, is there life around other stars? That's a really big question. And it's really challenging to answer unless, you know, maybe little green men turn up out of the sky, then we'll know the answer. But other than that, it's a hard question but we can start to break it down into smaller questions. A little bit of a smaller question is, are there habitable planets outside our solar system? Are there planets that are friendly to life outside of our own Earth? But this is still a pretty big question, so let's break it down a bit more and ask, what makes a planet habitable? What makes it a place that's friendly for life as we know it, and a place where life could potentially evolve? And this is a question that thousands of people working together for many years can actually start to answer. So let's look at elements of this based on our own Earth. One thing we know from life on Earth is that it needs an energy source. This can be sunlight, like for plants. It can be chemical energy, like the food we eat. It can be geothermal energy, like underwater volcanoes. We need a pretty pleasant temperature. We need nutrients, the right minerals and stuff for life to consume. We need air, although that varies depending on the life form. And we really need liquid water. So what's so special about liquid water? Well, as I learned from a video game called Spore when I was 12 years old, life evolved underwater and it was very cute. Why did life evolve underwater? It's because fancy chemical reactions can happen in water that can't happen without water. Water is a solvent, meaning that stuff can dissolve in it. And once stuff is dissolved, it can have chemical reactions that it wouldn't have otherwise. I think of this as the Alka-Seltzer principle. You take a really boring pill, you put it in water, and poof, chemical reaction. In this case, it makes some bubbles. But in the water, the lakes, or oceans at the beginning of life, we got fancy chemistry, not involving Alka-Seltzer, that made complex molecules such as RNA and DNA. So liquid water was necessary as the environment for the first life to evolve in. But to get liquid water, you need those pleasant temperatures. If it's too cold, all the water will be ice. If it's too hot, all the water will be steam. So to the temperatures that you get on a planet depend on the distance of the planet from a star. And to understand this, I think of the metaphor of standing by a campfire. Now, these people, they're going to get too hot. And these people, their toes are going to start to get cold. But this girl, the one who's taking a picture of the campfire, she's going to be just right. She's the right temperature. And She's Goldilocks. So we apply this concept to planets as well. Planets that are too close to their star are too hot. Planets that are too far from their star are too cold. Planets that are just the right distance, the right distance to have liquid water on their surfaces, they're just the right temperature, and they're in the habitable zone, which we also call the Goldilocks zone. 
Now, what planets are in the habitable zone in our solar system? Well, clearly Earth, because we've got liquid water. But if we look at the range of distances from our sun where a planet could conceivably have the right temperatures for water, you see that Venus and Mars, the green region is our habitable zone, Venus and Mars both lie in or near our solar system's habitable zone as well. And yet, only Earth has liquid water. And in fact, if we look at the average temperatures on the surfaces of these planets, we see that Venus is too hot and Mars is too cold. So clearly, distance from the star by itself cannot explain what allows a planet to have the right temperature for liquid water. Or to put this another way, astronomers assess whether a planet can have liquid water, mainly based on its difference from the star. Venus looks habitable to astronomers. So if Venus and Mars look habitable to astronomers, why is Earth the only planet in our solar system that we can actually live on? So this goes back to pleasant temperature. Clearly Venus and Mars don't have it. And why? The reason is air. Air acts like a warm winter coat. This is known as the greenhouse effect. So to understand this, we need to know that warm bodies, like our actual body and like Earth, lose their heat through infrared radiation. So if you look at this infrared camera photo of a man outside in the winter without a shirt on, you see that he's losing a lot of heat, and he is going to be very, very cold really, really soon. So, in order to prevent us from losing our heat and getting, sorry, I keep touching the microphone. In order to prevent us from losing our heat and getting really cold, we need something to cover us that holds in our infrared light, that absorbs infrared light. And incidentally, you should just do a Google search for thermal imaging pictures because it is really fun. So, what holds in our heat? What holds in our infrared light? A jacket. A nice warm jacket will absorb the infrared light coming off of your body and prevent it from escaping outwards. So in this picture again, the bright spots are where your heat, your body heat is escaping. The dark spots are where it's not escaping. So I want to take a vote here. Who do you think is wearing the warmer jacket in this picture? So. We'll do hand raising. If you think that this guy on the right is wearing the warmer jacket, raise your hand. If you think that this guy on the left is wearing the warmer jacket, raise your hand. Excellent. Very well done. So because he's dark in infrared, that means his jacket is absorbing the infrared light, the heat coming off his body. So, to get a greenhouse effect for our air to keep us warm, we need uh, molecules in our atmosphere that will hold in the heat, the infrared light coming off of the Earth. And molecules in our atmosphere that absorb infrared light include carbon dioxide, water vapor, methane, and ozone. Now, incidentally, I finally learned what global warming was all about when I was researching this. The one of these that is responsible for global warming is carbon dioxide. And the amount of carbon dioxide in our atmosphere that is, has increased by 50% since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. And that is largely due to man-made effects. And that's because if we burn a carbon-based fuel, the act of burning produces carbon dioxide. So carbon-based fuels like gasoline and coal are what are responsible for global warming. They're making our Earth's winter coat thicker. There are other gases in our atmosphere, oxygen and nitrogen, that since they don't really absorb infrared light, they don't really contribute to the greenhouse effect. They don't heat Earth much. So another vote. Which planet do you guys think has the most greenhouse gases? We'll do hand raising again. Who thinks it's Mars? Earth? Venus? Good, good. You guys are so good at this game. All right. Venus is 
the planet that's closest to the sun, closest to the heat source, and yet it's also the planet that's wearing the thickest winter coat. It's kind of a problem for Venus. Let's look at a few more bits of info about the atmospheres of Venus and Mars. So the pressure of an atmosphere, this is the pressure that's pushing down on your head if you're on the surface of the planet. The pressure in an atmosphere tells you about how much air the planet has. Venus has about 100 times as much air as Earth, whereas Mars has about 1% of the air of Earth. Now, Venus and Mars, their atmospheres are both largely made of carbon dioxide whereas Earth, its atmosphere is mainly oxygen and nitrogen. And Venus has, like, no water. This is not relevant, relative to Venus's atmosphere. This is relative to Earth. Earth has 250,000 times more water on it than Venus does. And Mars, it has very dry air, which is because it's so cold. If, you know if you go out in the cold and you need your chapstick and everything. But it does have a decent amount of water locked up in those polar ice caps. So let's zoom in on Venus. This is an image of Venus taken with, by a NASA mission with an ultraviolet camera. And in it, you can see only the clouds, the top layer of clouds on Venus. Similarly, if you look with your eyes, you also only see the clouds on Venus. It's opaque. And these clouds aren't water like on Earth. Venus has no water. These clouds are sulfuric acid. So Venus, not a very hospitable environment. If you decide you're going to forge ahead through the clouds and make it down to the surface, you'll find a pretty, a pretty inhospitable terrain with old volcanoes, not too much else. And this is kind of cool. So here is what the dirt on Venus, this is a mission from the USSR that actually went and landed on Venus and survived like a few, one hour or something before it was crushed. And this is the actual color of what the dirt probably looks like on Venus. Here's the color that it came out in the photograph. That's because the clouds on Venus are so thick that they filter out all the blue light from the sun. So you only get the red and yellow light down at the surface of Venus, so everything there looks yellow. So, kind of a boring place to live. So, I'm going to skip Earth because you guys are pretty familiar with it. On to Mars. So, this is a Hubble telescope image of Mars, and you can see its polar ice cap on the south. There's also one of those on the other side on the north. And there's quite a bit of water frozen up in the polar ice caps and the soil of Mars, enough to cover Mars and at least maybe 20 meters of water of oceans all over if these things melted. But they're not going to melt because it's super cold. Now, here is a slightly modified selfie that the Curiosity rover took of itself when it landed on Mars. So it's got a giant selfie stick. It's got a robotic arm that it sticks out and takes a picture of itself. Now, I doctored this photo a little. Can anyone tell what's been changed about this picture in the front row? Yeah. How about the other person in the front row? There's no redness. That is one thing. And behind you? <laughs> so that actually took a much more skillful doctor than me. This thing took like 50 pictures and then they combined them all so that with the selfie stick going every which way so that you don't actually see it. But what I changed is that. And the reason why is that before we sent any missions to Mars, we thought that the sky would look like this on Mars. Mars has such a thin atmosphere, 1% of Earth's atmosphere, that even in the daytime, we would expect that you would be able to see straight through the atmosphere out to the stars. But there's also, it's really dusty on Mars. There's so much more dust in the atmosphere. And that's what makes Mars's atmosphere 
Um, this is scattered light off of Mars's atmosphere that means that you can't see the stars from the surface. So we've seen how Venus, Earth, and Mars are different, but why are they different? Why is Earth the only planet with liquid oceans? Why doesn't Mars have air? And why does Venus have more, so much more air than Earth? I'd say, why doesn't Mars have much air, actually? So I'd like to say, these are still open questions. Like, there's a lot of research going on to answer these. And a lot of the answers that I'll tell you are things that people are still figuring out, and our ideas about them are going to continue to change, which is kind of cool. Um, but by looking at the planets as they are now and kind of gathering clues from that, as well as looking at other solar systems with younger planets, we can start to piece together what may have happened. So when the sun formed 4.6 billion years ago, it also formed a disk of hot gas and dust that was rotating around the sun. And the dust, tiny little molecules in in the disk, the dust kept running into itself and sticking together and forming bigger and bigger pieces of dust, then forming pebbles, then forming small rocks, then big rocks, then small moon-sized things that eventually ran into each other and made things the size of Earth. But when early Earth had first formed, there was still a lot of those dusts and rocks around, that dust and those rocks around which meant that Earth got run into a lot. There were like a lot of meteors back then. So early Earth, here's an artist's concept of what early Earth may have looked like. It would have had a lot of meteor craters on it. It was probably not a super pleasant place to live. And you can see in this artist's concept, in fact, part of the surface is melted because it's run into, but it's still being run into by so many meteors. And this period of Earth's history is sometimes called the Hadean period, literally for Hades, the god of hell, because it was probably hellish. So we don't really know what the ingredients were in Earth's atmosphere when it first formed, but we know that they probably changed a lot in those first 500 million to billion years. Two of the things that caused that change, one was bombardment by meteors, which would have boiled away whatever atmosphere was already there. And those meteors also brought new gases to Earth, including water. And there was also gases released by the molten lava and volcanoes and stuff. So there was a lot going on. And early Venus, it may have been kind of similar, but hotter. And also, um, and also perhaps with a little bit more gas but quite possibly similar. Early Mars is a bit of a mystery still. And the reason it's a mystery is that we see features like this on the surface that look like riverbeds. And there's lots of other evidence as well that there used to be liquid water on the surface of Mars. But the question is, back in the early days of Mars, like the first 500 million years of its life, was there liquid water there all the time? Or was it mostly frozen, but occasionally it would melt? So was early Mars warm and wet with rivers and oceans and stuff? Or was it just a giant ice ball, but occasionally something would happen to heat it up and cause a flood? Something that could do that would be if a meteor hit, it could melt the ice and cause the water to run down, make those stream beds, and then go away, turn back into ice. So that's still an unanswered question. So kind of recapping differences, Venus has 100 times as much air as Earth, Mars has only 1% as much air as Earth, and only Earth has liquid oceans. So just looking at the pictures of these planets, is there any differences you see between them that you think might be related to whether they could hold on to their air? All right, we'll come back to you.
Yes, very perfect description. <laughs> yep, that pretty much is the rest of the talk right there. <laughs> All right. The, the three factors for air loss that are different between these planets that I've identified are size, or the strength of your gravity, the magnetic field, which I was kind of cheating because I didn't actually show you the magnetic field, but he got it anyways and liquid water. Only Earth has liquid water, and we'll see how that affects the atmosphere. So let's start with size. So, oh right, let's show Mars first. Mars is smaller, and it has the weakest gravity. And having weak gravity means that you have a lower escape velocity. The escape velocity is how fast you have to throw something up in the air, so that it can escape from the planet. So imagine we have kind of a superhero pitcher here, and he's trying to throw a ball off the surface of the planet. He throws it at a certain speed, it goes to a certain height, then gets pulled back down by gravity. If he throws it slower, it won't go as high before it gets pulled back down. If he throws it faster, it will go higher before gravity pulls it down. But if he throws it fast enough, it'll go up and it'll never come back down. And that speed that you need to throw it at to get it to go up and never come back down is the escape velocity. So, on a smaller planet with lower gravity, there's a lower escape velocity. So the same pitcher throwing at the same speed might be able to throw a ball off of Mars at the escape velocity, but it would come back down on Earth. And what is that speed that they'd have to throw the ball at? On Earth, the escape velocity is 25,000 miles per hour. On Mars, it's 11,000 miles per hour. So, really a superhero picture here. So, due to its smaller size, Mars has a lower escape velocity which means that if there's something that hits the air, kind of gets it moving, the air is more likely to be able to escape from Mars than from Earth. Now, how about liquid water? I'm going to put in life in question marks there. So one thing that liquid water does is it allows chemical reactions to happen. Like we saw earlier, you get chemistry in water that you don't get elsewhere. And some of that chemistry is able to convert carbon dioxide into minerals and rocks. And in fact, it can, one of the things it produces is limestone. Now, if you look at the amount of limestone on Earth, to make it, you would need an amount of carbon dioxide that is roughly equal to the amount of carbon dioxide on Venus. So it's possible that Earth had a huge carbon dioxide atmosphere, like Venus, but that because we had liquid oceans, we were able to stuff all that crushing carbon dioxide atmosphere into rocks and get the lovely planet we have today. Now, the other thing is that water is heavy, and heavy molecules escape less easily. Water is heavier than hydrogen. So I have a metaphor for this, which is T-ball. If you think of that baseball as a hydrogen molecule, this kid looks like he's going to hit it hard, it's going to go really far, it's going to go really fast. In comparison, a water molecule weighs 18 times as much as a hydrogen molecule. And what weighs 18 times as much as a baseball? A two-liter bottle of soda. Is he going to be able to hit this as fast? He may hit it as hard, but it's just going to kind of go plop. So, the heavier the thing, the slower it goes with the same energy put into it. So in our solar, or on our planet, the sources of energy that are going into our air, that are giving it a certain speed, are thermal energy, the heat of our atmosphere, it's sunlight, it's solar storms, those coronal mass ejections I talked about, and it's cosmic rays, these energetic particles in space. And all of those will speed up the Earth's atmosphere. But hydrogen can escape much more easily than a water molecule can. So if you can keep all your hydrogen in water, you can hang on to it. So let's look at Earth. On Earth, um, our water is all kind of in the lowest layer of our atmosphere or on the surface in the oceans. 
The lowest layer of our atmosphere is the troposphere. That's where the clouds are. And the water pretty much stays in the oceans or in the clouds. But on Venus, because it's so hot, all the water is vaporized and goes up through all the layers of the atmosphere. And in the upper layers, sunlight can hit it and separate it into its component parts. And when it gets separated into its components, that hydrogen can go off into space. So Venus has lost a lot of its hydrogen. And if you don't have hydrogen anymore, you don't have water anymore. Do something else with the oxygen. So because Earth has liquid water, it was able to hang on to its water. It's paradoxical. You need liquid water to keep your water. And it was able to process a whole lot of carbon dioxide and put it in rocks instead of on top of our heads. So third factor, magnetic field. So something that makes Earth special compared to Venus and Mars is that it has a strong global magnetic field protecting the planet whereas Venus and Mars don't. So if you took your compass to Mars, it would not be very helpful at all. And there was a recent NASA mission called MAVEN that went to Mars to study how Mars loses its atmosphere. Now, if we compare Mars and Earth, here's a representation of Earth's magnetic field kind of surrounding it. And here's a representation of Mars's magnetic field. There's a few little splotchy bits, but almost none. Now, if we add a solar wind coming in, that's these dots coming in from the left, what happens? When the solar wind hits Earth's magnetic field, it's deflected around Earth, and it gets nowhere near the atmosphere, which is this thin layer right by the surface of Earth. But with Mars, it gets very close to the surface of Mars because there isn't that big magnetic field. And that means it's able to interact with the air on Mars and sweep it away. So MAVEN, the recent NASA mission I mentioned, actually saw when a solar storm hit Mars, sending in a lot of these particles, the mass loss, the air being lost from Mars, increased by a factor of 10. So that tells us that maybe if Mars had a magnetic field, it might be in a better shape than it is now. So we've seen three factors that can affect the loss of air. And let's tie this together a bit. Mars has such a low atmospheric pressure compared to Earth. That can be attributed to Mars's small size, so weak gravity, and its lack of a magnetic field. Venus has a very high pressure atmosphere compared to Earth, and it's largely carbon dioxide. And that can be attributed in part to Venus's lack of oceans since Earth was able to use up a lot of carbon dioxide by turning it into limestone in our oceans. But there's something that we haven't explained yet, which is Earth has a lot of oxygen in its atmosphere, which is not seen on Venus or Mars. And that brings us to the question of how did life affect Earth's atmosphere? So, 2.3 billion years ago on Earth, there was something called the Great Oxygenation Event. Before that, there wasn't that much oxygen in Earth's atmosphere, molecular oxygen. And then all of a sudden, there was. What happened? A thing called cyanobacteria, that's what's in the picture there, evolved photosynthesis. And photosynthesis takes carbon dioxide and water combined with light and converts it into sugar, which nourishes the organism, and oxygen, which goes into the air. So when photosynthesis evolved, that enabled Earth's atmosphere to start to have a lot of oxygen in it. And it was only when Earth's atmosphere had a lot of oxygen in it that creatures that breathe oxygen, like us, could start to evolve. So that brings us to the question of how can we detect life on planets outside our solar system? This is a very tricky question. Well, one of the things we can do is look for signatures in the planet's atmosphere that are similar to how life changed our atmosphere. So spectroscopy is looking at all the different oops, colors of light from a planet and how bright they are. 
and using that to learn what is in the planet's atmosphere. So here's a spectrum of Venus shown versus wavelength. And you see a feature that is caused by carbon dioxide. You also see that feature in Mars's spectrum and in Earth's. But in Earth's, you see things that you don't see for the other planets. You see a water feature. So you can look for this on planets in other solar systems in the spectrum of the planet to see if those planets have water. And that's a sign of habitability, a sign that things could be good for life there. And there's an ozone feature. Now, oxygen and ozone in Earth's atmosphere are largely attributed to the presence of life. So we consider them a biosignature, a hint that there might be life on this planet. So what makes a good biosignature? What makes a good sign that life exists on a planet? We want something that is produced by life and we do not want something that is produced by non-life. So we want something that falls in this area of our Venn diagram. Now, unfortunately, oxygen and ozone actually kind of fall in the middle. While on Earth, they're largely attributed to the presence of life, in different circumstances and with different chemical balances, it could be produced by things that aren't living. But if we look at the balance of different molecules that react with each other, then we can start to find where the presence of life is, take, is affecting the system. So methane will be destroyed in an atmosphere that has a lot of oxygen and ozone, but the presence of life can enable both of these things to exist in abundance with each other. So something that we're planning to look for in the atmospheres of extrasolar planets is to see the signature of both oxygen and methane together. And this is a big project. This is going to be one of the big goals of astronomy in the next couple decades to look for this. So the big question that I'm interested in is, is there life around other stars? And well, it's going to be a very tough question to answer. There are hints that we're going to be able to start searching for that life. And by looking at our own solar system, we're better able to prepare to answer this question. Thank you. the man in the blue shirt? <laughs> no. So I'm guessing that your question is how did Venus hang on to its atmosphere if it doesn't have a magnetic field? And I suspect, so I'd say that's still very much in the open question category, but I suspect that Venus having stronger gravity than Mars and having perhaps a thicker atmosphere to begin with. Both of those things made Mars especially susceptible to losing its atmosphere. So maybe Mars needed the protection of a magnetic field, whereas Venus didn't. Um, that guy, yeah. So different planets do different things. Mars, Earth has had a very fairly strong magnetic field throughout its history. Mars, in the first 500 million years of its history, had a strong global magnetic field. And we can tell this from looking in at the magnetic fields that are embedded in rocks that formed on Mars during that time. But it turned off. Why did it turn off? That's something to do with the inside of the planet, probably with the energy source that was powering the magnetic field ran out. Venus, as far as I know, 
has never had a strong global magnetic field. Um, it's particularly interesting that Mars had a strong global magnetic field and it seems to have turned off because the time that it turned off coincides with roughly the time that evidence of having much liquid water on the surface of Mars ended. So some people speculate that maybe Mars's magnetic field turned off it lost its atmosphere, it lost its water. Did, I don't think so, no. I think they're all dead, that there's not, there hasn't been new volcanoes for millions of years, I think. Uh, brown shirt, yeah. So there's, there's a few different methods that you can use to take a spectrum of an extrasolar planet. One is looking at the different wavelengths of light that are absorbed by the planet while it passes in front of the star. Another is looking at, and this has to be a planet that passes in front of the star then. Similarly, if the planet passes behind the star, you can look at what wavelengths of light disappear by how much when the planet passes behind the star. And the third thing we can do, which again, you need a very sensitive in instrument, is direct imaging spectroscopy to image the planet separate from the star and take a spectrum of that. Again, all of these, it needs to be really sensitive. There's a telescope that's being, the idea is being developed right now called Louvoir, something ultraviolet, optical, and infrared, maybe, laboratory, that would be kind of like a next generation Hubble telescope. And that would be very good for potentially detecting these biosignatures, the absorption signatures of methane and oxygen. Uh, the guy with sunglasses on his head. Mm, yes, yes. So carbon dioxide is made of carbon, which has weight 12, the weight of 12 protons typically, where and oxygen, which has the weight of 16 protons typically. So the total weight of carbon dioxide is heavier than water. But really the thing to ask is, is its components heavier than water? Because whatever molecule you have, water or carbon dioxide, if it makes it into the upper atmosphere of the planet, it's going to get dissociated there by ultraviolet light that hits, will break the molecule apart. So then you want to ask carbon and oxygen for carbon dioxide and hydrogen and oxygen for water. How heavy are those relative to one another? And hydrogen is the lightest by far. Carbon weighs 12 times as much as, water, as hydrogen. Oxygen weighs 16 times as much as hydrogen. And that means that hydrogen is lost so much more easily. So then you start with hydrogen, carbon, and oxygen in the upper atmosphere. You lose all the hydrogen. You've only got carbon and oxygen left. So you can put them back together and make more carbon dioxide, but you can't put them back together to make water. All right. For the people who've stuck around, uh, we're going to have an informal science panel here and try and answer your various questions that you might have about uh, the universe and the solar system and all of the parts. So um, first, yeah, let's move it back a little bit, but watch, watch your seat there, Ivana, because there's a hole in the ground you could fall through. Uh, so we have labels here with uh, our names and our kind of specialties, if you will, but we're generally prepared to answer, you know, whatever questions 
you might be able to come up with to varying degrees of success. Uh, but yeah, our speakers are, we've got Michael, who's a graduate student in planetary science department here. We've got Robin, who is a postdoc starting out here in a month or two. Uh, right now she's a postdoc at Columbia University in New York. Um, we've got Ivana, who's a graduate student in the astronomy department here, and then me, Cameron, who's a postdoc here. So, uh, what questions do you have? What's your question? All right, so it was a very good question. It was about Mars's iron core, so and whether or not the magnetic field cessation has anything to do with Mars's core freezing out. And so the short answer is yes. Um, so all, all terrestrial planets have uh, a mainly iron with some nickel and some other lighter elements core at the very center of the planet, very hot. Uh, a planet starts out extremely hot, so the core is probably all molten. Uh, right now on Earth, uh, our core it has an, an outer liquid core and an inner solid core. So our core is slowly over time as our planet loses heat, cooling and freezing. Now we know that Mars has a smaller core. Mars is a smaller planet in general, but it also has a smaller core relative to its size than Earth does. And yes, we believe that, uh, or it is generally believed that Mars's core has solidified. Uh, it, it lost heat a lot quicker than, than Earth did because of its smaller size, right? If you have a, a, a large Thanksgiving turkey, you can leave it out for you know, maybe a couple hours and it's still warm, but if you have a small like, uh, pheasant or something, it cools really fast. Same idea, right? After you cook it, it cools fast. Um, so. Uh, and that would cause Mars's initially liquid iron core um, to freeze. And one of the things that you need to create a magnetic field is motion of something that conducts electricity. And in terrestrial planets, that is your iron core. And if it freezes out, it just can't move. Wow, I feel like I'm back in grad school. Um, <laughs> okay, um, so the, the question was how, how dark matter and string theory are connected. Um, so I think I can best explain this by first explaining what we know about dark matter, which is very little, which is why it's called dark matter and not the name of some particle that we discovered it to be, exactly. Um, but we know a couple of its properties. Um, and the main one is that we know it interacts with other stuff that we can see in the universe through gravity. So it has what we would interpret as a mass, um, because mass is what you know, creates gravitational force. Um, so approaching this from the other direction, I can also say a tiny bit about string theory. If any of you guys at the table know more about it, you're welcome to chime in. Um, so, so string theory is one way of trying to explain how gravity works, essentially. Um, by postulating a way of, hmm, what's the best way to say, <laughs> what's the best way to say this? Anyway, it's, it's, it's like a, a, a theory of physics that, that tries to explain how gravity works, among other things. Um, and so where these two things come together is obviously in whether what we understand incorrectly is gravity or what we understand incorrectly is what kinds of matter there can be in the universe, right? Um, so, so like I said, the ways that we figure out how much, quote, dark matter there is around all have to do with looking at how it interacts with regular matter through gravity. And so one possibility is um, that we could be wrong about exactly how gravity works. Um, and th that's where what string theory is trying to explore. And another possibility is that there could be other kinds of matter out there that don't emit regular light, and that's where we come up with what we call dark matter. Um, so I think that's kind of the short answer um, to your question. Okay. My other question is for you, Cameron. How is the use of firepower to trap the electrons that are emitted from the magnetic field and the electrons? Okay.
So your question is, what would a wormhole that goes from in your house into your garden look like? So this is a question that filmmakers for the last 50 years have tried to conceptualize and produce in a variety of films. The most recent popular one, I think, was Interstellar, uh, that was uh, coincidentally was, was written by one of the faculty members in the department, Kip Thorne, who helped uh, produce, produce the film. Uh, but, so have you, have you seen that film? Well, so, so, but from, from the outside, so the, the idea of a wormhole, okay, just to make sure everyone is on the same page. Uh, the concept of a wormhole is a connection between two places in the universe that might not be adjacent to each other in, in traditional coordinates. So, for instance, I might have a wormhole that connects this spot on the table with this spot on the table such that I could drop something into it and it might arise from this location over here without visibly tra traveling between these two locations, like a portal, something like that. Um, and for those of you who have seen Interstellar, that was one of the main plot points, and I don't think I'm ruining anything here by, by saying that. I won't reveal much else about the plot. Uh, but having some sort of warp location that allows you to travel between two locations like that is, is generally the, the idea of a wormhole. So ideas of how it would look, people suggest that it might look like a black hole or that it might look like you're actually looking as though you're the observer at this location out when you look in here. Um, Well, it, it, it depends on what the structure of the wormhole is. It depends on what its size is. Uh, a lot of people conceptualize it as a black hole, and so that's why you get the curvature thing, is because of gravitational lensing near it. But we don't really know. We've never observed a wormhole. It's a theoretical construct that, that derives out of general relativity. But along with that, there are theories that these would collapse as soon as some structure passed through it. It's not it's not a foregone conclusion that these actually exist. And, and to try and uh, speculate on the manner of how these things would appear when we looked at them is speculation. It would depend a lot on the nature of GR and the nat uh, general relativity as well as the nature of the size of the structure that's allowing the, the, the wormhole to exist. But perhaps you guys have other ways of answering that question that I'm not addressing. Yeah, I think the answer is that we don't know, and uh, what you should do is study more math and more physics, and then write a PhD thesis on the topic, and then tell us. <laughs> other, other questions? To extend that question a little bit, is the current conception that uh, if wormholes do exist, that they are at the center point of existing black holes, and wouldn't that make them have to identify some sort of optical perception in light that be a non-issue? Stumped already. <laughs> So 
So if you've seen images, right, like in Interstellar, of what it looks like when you look at a black hole, that's actually how you obtain one of those images, is you, is you have a, pro a computer program that starts with the image as it would look without the black hole in it, and then you have the program follow the photons, the rays of light, as they would pass through near the black hole and compute what it would look like to you. Um, so I think in principle you could do the same thing for a wormhole if you could write down the right equations in general relativity to describe what the light would do when it passed through. And that's, where the, that's what Cameron was talking about when he said the difficulty of knowing what a wormhole is, is, looks like has to do with what choices you make about how to represent it when you write down the equations of general relativity. Um, and so that's why there's not just one answer to your question is because there are different ways in GR to make a wormhole and depending on which one you'll get a different answer from your computer program. Yeah, I can try answering this one. So I think when we look for life, we generally make the basic assumption that um, we're looking for planets within what we call the habitable zone, which is defined as a region in which liquid water can exist. So that assumes an assumption that life is going to need liquid water and that in, it's going to be similar to us in that respect, which isn't completely um, without a foundation because as far as we know, carbon base life forms are the most likely sort of thing that are going to be able to form the complex molecules that are necessary for life. And organic molecules that exist in space, like certain amino acids along those lines that um, are important for life, um, yeah, they do exist in clouds in space, so the building blocks of life are there. So we do operate based on that assumption, um, but other than that, we don't make any sort of other things when looking for life, if that makes sense. We don't make any additional assumptions, just water. Um, I mean, I think we can say that we actually really don't know. It's entirely possible at some point, like, that we could discover simple life on some other planet and we may not even necessarily recognize it because it's not in accordance with what we have come to think of as life. But if we do have more targeted searches in the future, yeah, the general trend seems to be um, some form of life forms that need some degree of water or a similar environment as we do. So. It's really like hmm? a practical Yeah. I mean, otherwise we would just be looking maybe everywhere and that doesn't seem efficient. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's true, though. Um, our experience biases what we're searching for. The fact that life as we understand it requires certain things means that that's going to be what we look for when in fact there might be life that we just don't. I mean, that's basically what you said. Mm -hmm. So. And the main reason we look for water is because it allows chemical reactions to occur readily, whereas when you don't have things that are in uh, like aqueous solution, uh, it, it, it's less likely that chemical reactions can take place. And we, chemical reactions are good for the development of life as we understand it. Um, so, uh, so the, the, the suggestion from the audience member was that perhaps any liquid can, a can enable reactions to take place readily, not just water. And I am not a chemist, but in my chemistry courses that I did take, uh, I understand water is a much better solution than other liquid substances in general. I don't remember why, but water in general, uh, perhaps someone, perhaps one of you guys did? 
So it has to do with the, uh, the nature of the water molecule. Uh, you've got oxygen connected to two hydrogens. And oxygen is really greedy for electrons. We call it, it has a high electronegativity. So it really pulls hydrogens, electrons in those chemical bonds towards it. And the overall water molecule then has this kind of tilted charge where the oxygen is a little bit more negative than the hydrogens and they're a little bit more positive. And that allows for some weak interactions with the other molecules that are dissolved in the water, uh, which basically allows for dissolving other molecules in the water because this each water molecule can sort of tug a little bit thanks to its slightly negatively charged end and it's too slightly positive to charge then. So that's basically why water is what we call the universal solvent. And so a place like uh, you might want to go look for other liquids, Titan, uh, moon of Saturn, is the only other body in the solar system that we know of with liquid, standing liquid at its surface. But that liquid isn't water because at Titan temperatures, water is as hard as rock, right? And what's liquid at Titan temperatures is natural gas, methane. Right, so you might want to look in the seas and lakes uh, of Titan that are made of methane, but at the same time, how much interesting chemistry can be done inside of a methane solution? And methane is not like water uh, in, in its polarity of charge. Methane is a much more well-balanced molecule. It's got this carbon in the middle of four hydrogens, and there's no lopsidedness to its electric charge. So it doesn't dissolve things quite as well. What is our general opinion on intelligent life? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, I have an opinion. I'll leave it to, to you guys. I'm going to interpret that to mean um, perhaps the likelihood of encountering other intelligent life, which I, I mean, this is, it's a difficult thing to quantify because you have to make a significant number of assumptions regarding, you know, what is, well, first say you start with a galaxy like the Milky Way. First you have to say there are about 100 billion stars in the Milky Way. How many of those um, stars have planets? And how many of those planets within those stellar systems are actually habitable? And then based on that, what is you know, the chance that it actually evolves some simple life forms? And then assume some other, other probability for these civilizations becoming advanced. You need to assume that they don't destroy themselves so they persist for a long enough period of time for us to detect them. And you also um, need to make the assumption that these civilizations are occurring at the same period in time in sort of, you know, just the entire age of the universe. It doesn't matter if there's an intelligent civilization that existed, you know, in the past millions of years ago before humans were able to detect, um, develop any sort of technology that would allow us to detect their existence. So when you consider a lot of those factors, I think it's extremely unlikely that we will ever come in contact with any other form of intelligent life. Um, I consider it to be more likely that we might discover some very simple life forms that are more like uh, just very simple bacteria, sort of prokaryote type of thing. But um, your estimates on the likelihood of life can vary wildly just because so many of these parameters are unconstrained. So, yeah. <laughs> the biggest advance on that topic in, in our lifetimes has been that we now kind of know about how many planets you might expect to find around a given star. Like that, has, that now we know that number. We didn't know that, what, mm -hmm. 15 years ago? <laughs> yeah, we didn't know there were exoplanets. Yeah, 20, <laughs> 20 years ago we didn't know there were any other planets around stars. So what Ivana was talking about is, and, and this is a good reference if you want to look after you go home tonight or tomorrow, um, is Drake's equation. Uh, and it's essentially, it was invented by this uh, astronomer named Frank Drake uh, 30, 30 years ago, 40 years ago. And it basically tries to characterize how many intelligent life forms or intelligent civilizations exist in the universe at a given time based on some of these kind of unknown parameters. But f Drake's equation, look it up and, and that'll provide some more context. Uh, 
I love the moon, but yeah, I think I have an answer. <laughs> <laughs> I really like the moon, so. Um, so the moon doesn't have, currently doesn't have a uh, like a permanent global magnetic field in the same way that the Earth does, but it's potentially it's potential that it did have one in the past. Um, and there are local magnetic fields on the surface, but it wouldn't take you very far. Um, but that's kind of a side point. The magnetic field, whether or not the, the, the moon has a magnetic field, I guess, yeah, it could play a role in the Earth's magnet magnetic field. But the fact that it doesn't, it's just swinging around us in its orbit. And uh, our own magnetic field is defined by the, the, the gyro in the interior of our planet. That's you know this rotating hot metal structure that that is that is generating our own magnetic field and it's it's really somewhat independent of the orbit of of the moon around us. I hope I did that. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Um, there is a very recent piece of work uh, that suggests that not the presence of the moon itself right now, but the er the formation process of the moon. So you know, one of the big questions uh, that you might have had after Jackie's talk was, well, you know, Earth and Venus are rel relatively the same size, right? And one of, the things, one of the things you might ask is, well, but Venus doesn't have a magnetic field. Why shouldn't it have a magnetic field when it's the same size as Earth? And it's basically made of the same thing. The atmosphere is different, but the atmosphere is just this really thin layer. We think that Venus and Earth are basically made of the same thing. So uh, as I was saying before when I was answering your question, one of the things you really need for a magnetic field is this turbulent motion in the core of a planet. One thing we know that was different about Earth's history and Venus's history is that we suffered a giant impact right at the end stage of our formation. And that giant impact s stripped away a bunch of our planet into what coalesced into our, our moon. And Earth has a very abnormally large moon. Uh, compared to, you know, if you look at the other moons in the solar system, they're all tiny little rocks compared to the, the planet that they orbit. Jupiter, well, Jupiter's huge, so it's, yeah. got, it's got big moons, but Jupiter is also big itself. Um, so we have a, a relatively large moon compared to our planet size, and Venus doesn't have a moon at all. So it could be that what really kick-started the violent motion in our core that gave us the magnetic field was this giant impact event early on in our history that created our moon. And that uh, really, uh, if that's true, then it means Earth is even more special than we thought it was. I mean, Earth is special for all sorts of reasons. We've got liquid water. We've got this uh, nice, habitable atmosphere sheathing us. Um, all of these things could be coincidences that may then lead to intelligent life developing. And one of those other coincidences is that we, you needed to have a giant impact so that you could have a magnetic field. That just means we're e even that much more special. Even the panelists learn something. So, yes. Oh no. Okay. One at a time. Would you like to? Theoretically. Theoretically or practically. practically. Both, both, uh, both of these options are, are. We have the technology to, to. F f the bulk of the technology exists to be able to do this. It's just extremely expensive. Um, there have been a number, obviously, a number of science fiction books written on both of these topics. But there have been a number of books that have been written by scientists in the last few years, indicating what, what resources would have to go towards this in order for for colonization and civilizations to exist on, on both the moon and Mars. Um, on the moon, the main concern is uh, fuel and water, but recent development indicates that there is there are permanently shielded craters in the polar regions of the moon where uh, water could exist in a frozen form because it's never being hit by solar radiation, which would heat it up, and then it would quickly evaporate off into the void of space. Because the moon, unlike the planets that we saw today, has no atmosphere whatsoever. Um, so so you, you, you can't 
keep a hold of liquid water on the surface. It would just immediately evaporate away, but there could be ice in these craters. And the use of those ice craters could be uh, used for, for both using the oxygen in water as a, an a, you know, a way of us breathing, as well as water for us to consume and, and to develop uh, other vegetation and such. But it would basically have to be in shielded locations, you know, like uh, buildings that, that had their own atmospheres. Um, and similar on, on Mars. Le it's more challenging to get to Mars because of the distances involved, but the raw materials there and the atmosphere is more habitable by us than is true on the moon. Yeah. Do you guys have anything to add? Or? Okay. Bailey's ship? about Thales' ship or about how it might apply to some astrophysical topic? Oh, that's a pretty general question. Um, I think it's a, it's a philosophical question how you define something and when you replace it. Like if you have a house and you replace the door and the furniture and the walls and such, if it still is the exact same house that you had, it's a philosophical and semantic dis decision and it doesn't really have any practical uh, answer, so I'm not going to speculate on that. And in terms of how it might apply to an astrophy astrophysical structure, uh, I don't know. We as biological creatures are constantly cycling through the cells in our bodies, but we're, I still consider me to be me, even though I've changed in a million different ways over the course of my life. That's not astrophysical, but it's scientific. What's the question you're asking? I'm not sure how to answer that. Um, I'm not sure exactly what your question is. Are you talking about the fact that the time it would take us is so long that we might not be the same species at the other end? Hmm. Yeah, I think that's the that's definitely uh, above my pay grade. I'm a I'm an astrophysicist, not a philosopher. <laughs> That's true. Uh, Venus is a slow rotator, and uh, one of the things that can give motion to the iron in the core is definitely the fact that the planet is rotating. It turns out, though, that 
Venus would have to rotate a lot slower than it even already does for that to matter. Um, so it's not that it's not the fact that Venus is rotating slowly. Um, one of the things, though, that uh, can also give rise to these circular motions called convection in, in the core is heat loss from a planet. And so Earth, we have this nice thing called plate tectonics where it's the cause of earthquakes and volcanoes uh, along fault lines. Um, that allows a lot of heat to escape from the interior. So you can actually drive this convection where hot stuff is being moved from the bottom, the core of the planet, to the top, cooling, then getting more dense and sinking. Uh, on Venus, uh, there, is no, there aren't, aren't any plate tectonics. We call it a stagnant lid. It's like the entire uh, upper crust of Venus is th just this one solid uh, sphere, or uh, not sphere, but um, shell. So a stagnant lid that doesn't allow so much heat to escape, and so you can't get that convective motion. That's more important on Venus. Before we take any questions, um, I just had an update. Uh, no one's currently, uh, well, we still have volunteers at the telescopes, but there are no uh, audience members at the telescopes. So in the next 10 minutes, they're going to shut, shut down the telescope. So if you haven't had an opportunity to check out the, the objects through the telescopes, I suggest you go out there ASAP. But we'll still be going until 10, so you've got a few minutes to come back. Uh, are there any other additional questions? Yeah. Thank you. Oh yeah, thanks for coming. Any reading suggestions on um, on what topic? On general astronomy? On uh, can they be fiction? Okay. Um, you guys have suge suggestions? I have to think them up. Oh, well, uh, there's... Oh, okay. Uh, there's... Yeah. Um, there... Okay. Yeah, give you a chance to think. So, so one of... This is not... This is something I came to after I was in graduate school, but if I had read it I kind of wish that I'd read it younger. So there's a, there's a couple of, of science fiction novels by a guy named Alistair Reynolds. And he is an astrophysicist who writes novels. And the thing that I think is so fun about his novels is that he tries to take things that are like actual physical laws and make them plot features sometimes in his story. So a good example of this is... Um, is that in his, you know, science fictional universe, um, there is no faster than light technology. And so this problem that our friend up front was describing, where like different civilizations sort of veered off in different directions and are almost not recognizable at the same species, is a thing that is a feature. And there are, there are other plot features that have to do with this, like, you know, you can get separated from someone because you were frozen and put on the wrong ship, and then you end up at the wrong it, at the wrong planet, but you'll never get back. And even if you did, the other person that you were traveling with is going to be dead for hundreds of years because the the fact that you're traveling close to light speed when you when you're traveling between planets, things like this. So so that that I always thought was really cool because a lot of times in science fiction, what you find is that people try to get around the inconvenient parts of physics, um, like. Like in Star Trek, you know, they have like this super light speed thing where they can just go to warp drive if they need to get somewhere fast. Um, but I think it's way more interesting to explore like these kinds of issues that are that sort of hinge on the physics being the way that, way that it actually is in our universe, and then answering sort of that kind of the questions in that context. I thought that was really fun. Um, so that that's one thing where I think Alistair Reynolds. Yeah, it's A L A Stare. <laughs> S C A R. Um, and he actually, I think he's now making enough money from his books that he doesn't have to work anymore. But for a long time, he worked at, um, at in Leiden, um, in the Netherlands. He was he was working for USA for a while. Um, yeah. So he has a series that starts. What's the first book? 
Do you remember? It, there's a there's a trilogy that he wrote that then has like an extra book that's in the same universe added onto it later. Um, and I think the first one was called. Uh, I'll look it up. <laughs> but yeah, if you look, he doesn't have that many books out because it's kind of a lot of work to yeah. to construct a, a universe that obeys the real laws of physics and still has you know sci-fi in it. Um, but but I always thought that was pretty that was pretty fun. Um, and some of it is about like the social and, and like political aspects of how this would play out, and then other of, of it is just like straight up, like like people zooming around in spaceships, shooting each other kind of stuff. <laughs> so <laughs> that's also fun. Did you think of yeah, the one you were thinking of? Thinking of. Um, uh, the book is Contact. The film was also made. It's by Carl Sagan, who's written 25, 30 years ago. Uh, both the book and the film are, are good. In general, I, I, I go with the, the book is better. There are more plot points in the book than are covered in the film, although the film is pretty well done. Um, and actually, speaking of books that were made into films, The Martian, the book is really excellent as well um, and very entertaining. But there's a lot of cursing, but it's pretty funny. Uh, it's a very it's a very quick read. Um, other than that, yeah, I have a lot of other suggestions, but they might not be on on point. So. I will say that one of the things that got me into astronomy in the first yeah. place was that I wanted to be an astronaut. And funnily enough, the book that slash movie that made me interested in being an astronaut was called The Room, hmm. which you wouldn't necessarily expect. Not they the right all stuff. Died, but and then I read the right stuff, and then I wanted to be an astronaut even more. <laughs> but. So I have um, one suggestion for a book, which I thought the concept was pretty interesting. So it's called Speaker for the Dead and by uh, Orson Scott Card. And what it explored is the question of intelligent life, not necessarily whether or not it, it exists, but when humans encounter it, um, more so cultural differences between the groups and what we may sort of think of as being um, immoral or something along those lines or our version of ethics might be different than their version of ethics just because of our different sort of evolutionary paths and something along those lines. So it's less scientific but it explores more of the perhaps philosophical questions involved with what other intelligent civilizations might be like and that entire issue of can we even recognize them as being intelligent in the way that we've come to sort of know that as being true. So yeah. yeah. Do you have a suggestion, Mike? <laughs> sure. If you want to go nonfiction and learn more about planetary atmospheres, there's this excellent textbook that doesn't look like a textbook or read like a textbook at all. It's by Andrew P. Ingersoll. It's called Planetary Climate, and it's literally, you know, it, it it's it looks like a novel and it reads like a novel. He's got a chapter in there where he's like, "What if you were in a hot air balloon in Jupiter?" what would you see? And he just takes you on a hot air balloon ride in Jupiter and tells you about the science there. Uh, and all the math and the equations are cornered off in little boxes interspersed, so depending on your ambition or your level, uh, you can choose to go through those derivations or not and enjoy the book um, the way you want to, yeah. <laughs> that was a great question. <laughs> we're, we're all sci-fi nerds. <laughs> I uh, so in terms of iron, like relative, so like yeah, uh, it's it's basically the same as Earth. Uh, in so you get you get how much iron is in a planet by knowing its size and its mass, and then you can get its bulk density, which tells you roughly what it is made out of, what percent iron silicates or rocks and, and lighter materials. And if you just assume that things were made from the same building blocks, basically the asteroids that we see and the, the, the meteors that land on Earth that we can pick up, um, then uh, Mars has to have a small core. Earth and Venus are practically the same, and Mercury is almost all core. 
um, so almost all iron. And, um, but we don't know for sure that Venus has a core because you can imagine that all of that iron material is just spread out evenly within Venus's interior. Of course, it probably does have a core because that's just how things form. Heavier things uh, that don't mix well, like iron, will just tend to sink towards the center of a body. But until we can land a spacecraft on Venus that lasts more than an hour uh, and take basically uh, size, size, seismology uh, readings, you know, uh, the s same thing that we uh, do to study Earth and the, er the things that make the earthquakes and what's inside of Earth's uh, uh, interior, we don't actually know what the structure is for sure, although theory can predict that it, you know, it basically it does have a core. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so there's a, a professor at Santa Cruz who has done extremely detailed computational modeling of the flow. And honestly, when I look at it, it looks like like a hairball. You know, <laughs> it's um, there's a lot of complicated physics that I don't understand that goes into that. The flow basically needs to be somewhat uh, like a column, like going spiraling up like this, but it's got all sorts of different... Um, uh, structures to it. The overall field is a dipole. So uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with the term dipole, it just means something that resembles a bar magnet, something like, you know, with a north pole and a south pole, and it creates these nice lobe fields. Um, but that's the, s the dominant structure of the field. If you get really, really close up, you can start to tease out the higher order you know, uh, uh, spherical harmonics. So besides a dipole, the next thing is a quadrupole and then an octopole. Oh, there we go. Yes, so there's our dipole. It looks, for all the world, like Earth is basically one big bar magnet with a north pole and a south pole. Um, and that's mainly... North and south, and that's it's mainly because Earth's uh, magnetic field is generated very deep inside of the planet in its core. Uh, on the other hand, if you take a planet like Uranus or Neptune, its field is generated most likely not at the center, because on Uranus and Neptune, the center is just rock and ice. Uh, but instead, in a thin layer, somewhere inside the planet, but not at the center, some uh, basically water that has been squeezed so much that it acts as a metal, meaning that its electrons are free to move places. And so Venus, I mean, not Venus, this is Uranus or Neptune, Uranus or Neptune, it's, it doesn't have a dipole field. The, the, the quadrupole and the octopole moments are really, really strong. And I don't actually know how to draw them, but they don't look simple like this. <laughs> um, and that's just the consequence of its magnetic field being generated in some other layer closer to the surface. And this one, this one's Earth. Yeah. Okay. Thanks for the blackboard. I don't know the answer to that either. <laughs> that, that answer might not be known. Go for it. I don't know. Oh, I thought you said you. <laughs> no, I. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what, so, what is the South Atlantic anomaly?
I have no idea. I'm sorry. <laughs> Is that the Bermuda Triangle? Is that really? What? <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. So I actually don't know how well I can answer that question. So let me just say that. I know more about life in the universe from perhaps a more theoretical side regarding its likelihood. Um, and yeah, again, I, I don't think I can answer that question very well, so perhaps someone else can. So uh, Jackie had made mention of the, the Uvoir or Louvoir mission that's potentially going to occur. But if it were to occur, it would be 2030, something like that. And that's basically a glorified Hubble Space Telescope. It's a, m it's a larger version of the Hubble Space Telescope. I think it's eight meters in diameter, whereas Hubble is two, two and a half, 2.4 meters, something like that, 1.4. I'm not sure. Um, and uh <coughs> so it'll have the capacity to, to maybe pick up on some of these biosignatures. But in general, with JWST, because it's an infrared and near-infrared uh, telescope, it may be more challenging to pick up on some of the observational signatures of life as we currently understand it. That's not to say in the next 10 years we might come up with other ways to detect uh, biosignatures, but, but currently we rely on more of the optical part of the spectrum and the, and the UV, potentially the UV part of the spectrum. So. Uh, yeah, I agree. It's it's going to be tough. J JWST is is going to do great things for astronomy, but I think in terms of characterizing the habitability of an Earth-sized planet, it may not be good enough for that. It can probably tell us whether or not the atmosphere is really thin like Mars is, really thick like Venus is, but it probably can't get us the spectral resolution that we need for all the biosignatures. It's a sort of on a longer term that has is aiming at characterizing planets to some extent is is called W first and it's also a an infrared telescope like James Webb is going to be but it's about the same size as Hubble essentially um, and the thing that that's going to have that makes it special for planetary work is a coronagraph so it's basically just a thing to block out all the light from the stars so you can try to see the planet next to it um, and they have the capability to put like a very coarse spectrograph on there, but I don't know if it's good enough to see the like the kind of signatures you need to tell if a planet is habitable. I don't know if any of you guys know that, which is why I'm bringing this up. Um, I should probably know this, but anyway. Um, so the, the the short story is like, yeah, there's there's a couple of missions coming up that even though they may not be the one where we say, oh, hey, look, there's some oxygen and some methane in the spectrum they're going to tell us a lot more about the population of planets that does exist. Because right now our view of that is pretty limited based on the technology that we have so far. And as that gets better, we'll have more information on many different, from many different sources about sort of what kinds of planets there are out there and what we expect to find. Um, so when, once we get to the point where we can build something like this UVAR mission, um, we'll know a lot better what it is that we're looking for and where to look for it. Any other questions? Yes. Through thermonuclear weapons. Uh, well, the whole idea of, OK, so, uh, to make sure everybody hears, uh, he asked, is it possible to uh, terraform Mars through thermonuclear weapons? Um, I mean, the whole idea of terraforming has, it, as far as I know, has never actually well, we've certainly never done it around a planet, but, but on even on small scales, the idea of terraforming seems like 
an idea, but I don't think it's been tested in any kind of macroscopic way. Um, but also through just, you mean, so just like nuke the surface and melt the water that might be present subsurface and then hopefully it'll be able to hold on to that water. Because as Jackie talked about, one of the main problems with uh, Mars not having, you know, leading to Mars not having an atmosphere wouldn't be avoided. Like even if you dumped a bunch of water onto the surface of Mars right now, okay, it'd stay wet for a while, but those problems still will eventually disrupt any kind of water that might try and remain on the surface. It's a low mass system. It doesn't have a magnetic field. And so those uh, hydrogen atoms are going to very quickly evaporate and escape the escape velocity of the planet and go away. So we'd have to come up with some other mechanism for holding on to uh, the hydrogen, which enables the presence of water on the surface. And just introducing a bunch of water either by having comets that have a lot of ice landing on there or us dumping a big bowl of water on it or uh, nuking interior water and, and causing it to go up and made it make into the atmosphere temporarily. It's not going to solve the long-term problem that it just can't hold on to it because it doesn't have enough mass leading to enough gravitational pull to hold that stuff there. So in short, I think I've concluded that no, th that's, not going to, that's not going to solve the problem. Right. Yeah. But if we could come up with some means for containing uh, that, either with, yeah, potentially causing a magnetic field or giving it some sort of artificial form of mass, yes, but I don't think just introducing a bunch of water right now is going to solve the problem. We're back. Nice. Did you hear me? Yeah. You got that? <laughs> cool. Okay, well, <laughs> uh, we're basically out of time. It's 10 o'clock. But um, thank you guys for all coming and sticking around quite so late.